Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Peter McBride. I'm the director of the Corn Centre, and it is my wonderful privilege to welcome you this evening to this Sodora lecture. Um, I want to just let you know, first of all, that the, the, the event is being recorded and it may, <clears throat> so that other people will be able to enjoy it. So it's just to let you know that. But you're, uh, those who are who are, are witnessing this are, are not part of that recording. You're not visible on the screen. Um, so don't worry about that. I also want to start by paying my respects to the Abenaki, Penacook and Wabanaki Confederacy peoples, uh, past and present, on whose ancestral lands we live. So I just want to recognize that we live on those lands. And to give you a little bit of an introduction to this Sador series of lectures. Uh, this series of lectures is named after uh, Saul O. Sador um, and are named in memory of him. Saul Sador was born in New York uh, in 1907. He was the son of immigrants and he became involved in the knitting industry in 1931. In 1940, he moved his business to Manchester, New Hampshire uh, where it's known as Brookshire Knitting Mills and later as Pandora. He died in 1964 after seeing the company grow and flourish to the point where it employed more than 600 people. Sol Sador's success was based on the principle that ethical business practices were the only sure way to grow a business and provide security for its employees. He pioneered a profit sharing plan, instituted a pension plan, was the first in New Hampshire to employ an industrial psychologist, ensured hospitalization benefits for his employees, and founded a scholarship loan fund to send his employees' children to college. He was a member of the New Hampshire Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights and a driving force for the ideals of humanity and brotherhood in Manchester, the state of New Hampshire, and actually throughout the nation. The Sador Foundation and the Sador Lecture Series have been established to support campus presentations by speakers on emerging ideas and to enhance faculty efforts to challenge students and the wider community to participate in dialogue around original, provocative, and sometimes controversial issues facing society. The governor has um, decided that or called this month, this month of April, Genocide Awareness Month. And, and we have in this month been trying to focus our attention on uh, various historic and indeed ongoing genocides. And tonight uh, we're going to look at, uh, at, think about the Armenian genocide. And we have, we're really delighted to have Dr. Elisa von Joden Forgi speaking to us this evening. And the title of her presentation is going to be The Enduring Genocide Against the Armenians. So it, it is a contemporary presentation. Indeed, if you come into the library, into the Mason Library, uh, you'll see that we have an exhibit up. Uh, that, that you're welcome to walk around, which was done by one of our past students, Elizabeth Allard, uh, and the title of that is We Remember, and that, that gives a very visual presentation of, of, of some of the issues around the historic Armenian genocide. Uh, Dr. Elisa von Jordan Forge is the Endowed Chair of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College. She is a dear friend and a colleague of mine, and as always, it has been a privilege to get to know her over the last while, and I can tell you she is a joy to work with. Um, prior to coming to us in Keene State College, Elisa served as the Dr. Marsha Ratikoff Grossman Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Stockton University. It was there that she started the first graduate level academic cert certificate program in genocide prevention. Elisa earned a BA from Columbia University and a PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania. Her teaching and research are on genocide prevention, gender and genocide, comparative genocide, the Holocaust, sexualized violence, imperialism, race and war. I can't tell you how delighted I am that Elisa agreed to do this lecture for us. It is a great privilege for us to have her to do this. She is a world expert on it. And without further words from me or further ado, I'm going to hand you over now to Dr. Elisa von Joden Forge. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction, as well as for the invitation to speak as part of this wonderful inaugural Sador lecture series. Um, it is a great honor to be here. I'm coming at the end of several really wonderful presentations this semester. Um, and so I'm quite honored. 
to, um, to be here today. And I also want to thank everybody who is in attendance tonight for bearing with yet another Zoom presentation during our difficult first year of the pandemic. Let us all hope that very soon we could start meeting in person again. So the theme of this series, this semester, the Sidor series is remembering to heal. And this theme is of course directly relevant to the survivors of the 1915 Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire, who are now in their fourth and fifth generations. And it's also directly relevant, of course, to survivors of other genocides, more recent ones, as well as ones that date further back. Genocide, as we know, is an enormous, complex, and very intimate form of atrocity that, because it is directed at an identity group um, causes deep and lasting trauma. Trauma which forces us to ask, what does it mean to heal in the face of such horrific wrongs? Um, I wanna share two little stories. One is of a Catholic father at the Center for Dialogue in pray and Prayer in the Polish town of Oswiecim, near the former Auschwitz death camp who once said to me when I was there visiting the camp and its museum, he said to me, the Holocaust is a permanent wound on the body of humanity, a permanent wound. And that raises the question, can we heal from genocide? The second story I want to share with you is the story of the Holocaust survivor and philosopher named Jean Amery, who postulated in an essay entitled Resentments, um, that efforts to heal from the Holocaust, efforts that have been closely tied often to calls to forgive the perpetrators, are a moral affront, in fact, to the memory of the victims. He saw memory of the wrongs done and an active and continuing resentment deep of them as a moral placeholder that is required of us to honor the dignity and the worth of those who perished. So his work raises the question for us, should we heal from genocide? I would like to start my exploration of these questions tonight with the recent war fought between the autonomous government of um, a place called the Republic of Artsakh and the independent state of Azerbaijan in the South Caucasus territory known as Nagorno-Karabakh. Oh, pardon me. Okay. So here you will see a map of that region. And as you can see in the map, Nagorno-Karabakh is a small mountainous enclave in the southern part of the South Caucasus that links the post-Soviet republics of Armenia and Azerbaijan. It has enormous strategic interest to both Azerbaijan and neighboring Turkey, which are interested in establishing a corridor that they call either the Nachichevan corridor or the Zangazur corridor, right through the bottom part, the southern part of Armenia, to link their two countries together, which would allow Azerbaijan, which is an oil rich country, um, to export oil directly to Turkey, bypassing Iran, and which would allow Turkey direct access to Central Asia, as part of the current president Recep Tayyip Erdogan's resuscitation of pan-Turkish dreams in the region. So the most recent war, which um, some of you may have heard about, but was not well um, followed in the uh, international press and particularly not in the American press, uh, this most recent war, which many Armenians refer to as the Second Artsakh War, 
was fought between this 27th of September and the 9th of November, 2020, a mere 44 days, which took the lives of over an estimated 10,000 people on both, um, including both sides. Before the recent war, Nagorno-Karabakh was legally recognized as a part of Azerbaijan, but its majority population has always been Armenian. And that majority population broke away from Azerbaijan in 1991 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So this territory um, has effectively been occupied by Armenia after um, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and since 1994, when Armenia gained control of the region after a brutal six year war, uh, which claimed over 30,000 lives. This occupation was, however, indirect as Nagorno-Karabakh was governed as the autonomous Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, also known as the Republic of Artsakh. Um, though its military was highly integrated with the armed forces of Armenia. So it was a complicated occupation by Armenia, um, which Armenia argued was very much about supporting the rights to self-determination of the majority Armenian population in the territory. This 2020 war that was fought last fall brought the arrangement of this 1994 ceasefire to an end and replaced it with a new ceasefire agreement. This tripartite agreement, which was brokered by Russia, um, according to it, Armenia and Azerbaijan agreed to return most of the territory um, of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Russia has sent peacekeepers to control the remaining regions of Artsakh, as well as a small territory connecting Artsakh to Armenia called the Lachin Corridor. So on this map, you will see Armenia in sort of a darker orange and the remaining Russian occupied part of Artsakh in a lighter orange. The ceasefire agreement because of the loss of territory was a terrible and painful blow to Armenians worldwide. And it ushered in a period of domestic turmoil, soul searching and trauma, which continues to this day, especially in light of the relative international silence surrounding Azerbaijan's conduct during and after the war and the perceived and deeply felt betrayal by Western powers. And we'll discuss that in a moment. So let us take a moment to talk a little bit about Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, as I mentioned, is an oil rich country with great strategic importance due to its resources and its position on the west side of the Caspian Sea. Since the fall of the USSR, it has become very wealthy and has developed close ties with Turkey and more recently with Russia. So with the two um, regional and in Russia's case, global powers. Internally, it is governed as an autocratic state and ranks low on indexes of freedom of the press and human rights. Over the past decades, it has engaged in several violations of the ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh. So that's the 1994 ceasefire because it never fully accepted Armenian occupation of its lands there. Um, this, these uh, violations included a small war fought in the territory in 2016, which was also um, um, sort of um, during which time um, many atrocities were committed by the Azerbaijani soldiers and military and which then in a sense presaged what was to come in this war. Unfortunately, since 2016 in particular, Armenophobia has on, been on the rise in Azerbaijan, both in its, its official political discourse, as well as in its education system. 
And the ferocity of this 2020, this recent war, has demonstrated some of the consequences of this Armenophobia. Several analyses of the start of this most recent war suggest that it was in fact the Armenian, uh, pardon me, the Azerbaijani military that ignited the conflict with an attack on the capital city of Stefanakert on September 27th. Azerbaijan, um, in the summer preceding this war, had already conducted joint military exercises with its ally Turkey um, in the previous summer. And in August of 2020, the Azerbaijani defense minister made statements that with the help of the Turkish military, Azerbaijan would fulfill its sacred duty by which he meant taking back Azerbaijan's lost territories, in other words, Nagorno-Karabakh. So there seems to have been a great deal of preparation for the war in 2020. At around the same time in the summer of 2020, Turkey began recruiting Syrian mercenaries um, with the um, uh, with the invite to fight Christians for Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh. While some estimates of the number of mercenaries used by Azerbaijan and Turkey in this war are as high as 4,000, other sources have confirmed a lower number of about 300 fighters drawn from the ranks of militias under Turkish control in Northern Syria, including former members of terrorist groups like ISIS uh, that were fought uh, most recently out of the territory of Iraq. These young men, these recruits were offered about 1800 US dollars for their service in the war with extra bonuses reportedly um, for particular atrocities like the beheading of Armenians. Many of these men, it has to be said, who were recruited um, have very few options at this point, given the situation in Syria and in refugee camps in Turkey. So for them, this offer was very attractive and they often take up mercenary positions as they are offered. It should be noted that Turkey has used similar mercenaries in Libya, um, of course, in Syria, and there are concerns that it may be using them in the Kashmir crisis uh, in between Pakistan and India. Um, these mercenaries died in this war, some of them, and were wounded during the war and received very little compensation. By some reports, they did not even receive what was promised to them or appropriate medical care. So these are not well treated troops. Over the summer before the war, at the same time Turkey was recruiting mercenaries, Turkey was also releasing propaganda videos that laid the justification for war. One video that it released was entitled Two States, One Army, referring to Turkey and Azerbaijan as a combined for fighting force and playing on the pan-Turkic slogan of two states, one people, or two states, one nation, which is meant to highlight the historical connection between Anatolian Turks and the Azerbaijani people who speak a related Turkic language and also consider themselves to be the descendants of the Seljuk incursions in the 11th century that eventually set the stage for the creation of the Ottoman Empire. The international press during this war, uh, to the extent that it has covered the war at all, has tended to engage in a superficial both sides ism, which is supposed to constitute fair and accurate reporting. From the beginning of the war, press reports used passive language to describe what was going on. So we read in many headlines, for example, that renewed fighting breaks out, passive tense, right, in Nagorno-Karabakh. This both sidesism, which fails to place the Karabakh war in its wider geopolitical and historical context, 
has also influenced human rights organizations looking at this crisis, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, who have been criticized for tending to seek balance between the two sides in a way that has drastically skewed what is happening in favor of Azerbaijan. And this both sidesism has reached even the highest level of international organizations as well. Recently, um, and you could see an article on this um, on the slide, human rights, UN human rights experts erroneously and misleadingly stated that both sides of the conflict still had prisoners of war, even though Armenia has returned all of its prisoners of war. And we can only think that this was in an apparent attempt to look nonpartisan. That is that these UN experts wished to appear nonpartisan and therefore asked that both parties continue or to complete, as they put it, um, the exchange of POWs. So Armenia gave back its POWs very quickly after the end of the war, whereas Azerbaijan is still holding an estimated 200 Armenian soldiers and some civilians. And according to international human rights organizations is subject subjecting these POWs or some call them hostages because some were taken after the cessation of hostilities and outside of the actual uh, battlefield. Um, some human rights, inter uh, pardon me, international human rights organizations suggest that these people, these POWs and hostages are being subjected to torture and other mistreatment while in detention. Now, what has been missed in all of this balance that is being sought by the international community is that Azerbaijan is in fact exhibiting very worrisome telltale signs of genocidal ideology and practice and has been granted impunity um, by its powerful ally, Turkey, as well as by the relative silence of the international community when it comes to Azerbaijan's conduct. So I would like to share with you a very sad example of this conduct. And I apologize in advance for the disturbing details that I will only read. On November 22nd and December 3rd of last year, that is of 2020, and that is after the November 9th Russia brokered ceasefire between, um, Nagorno between Artsakh, the Republic of Artsakh and Azerbaijan um, and the state of Armenia. Um, so after this ceasefire agreement, two videos were posted from Azerbaijani social media accounts on the social media platform called Telegram, which showed an elderly Armenian man being beheaded by Azerbaijani soldiers. So here I want to give you a slide of sort of what Telegram looks like. It is a dual encrypted social media site. So a very secure social media site that is increasingly being used um, to post hate speech and, and genocidal videos and images, not just by Az Azerbaijani soldiers, but by, um, by groups all over the world. In the first video, which came out on November 22nd, the Armenian man begs them not to behead him and they laugh at him. They continue to sever his head with a small knife as he is begging for his life. And then they hold up his severed head for the camera. In the second video, which was posted on Telegram on December 3rd, um, the Azerbaijani soldiers show what they do with his head after he is beheaded. The soldiers try to place his head on the body of a pig, and then they laugh as they do so. 
The beheaded man was confirmed by local villagers and by human rights organizations to be an Armenian civilian from the town of Martakert in the territory of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh. The soldiers were confirmed by local villagers and by human rights organizations to be um, Azerbaijani servicemen by their uniforms and the language they were speaking. And this confir confirmation was made by human rights organizations as well as by the Guardian newspaper. The victim's name was Gennady Petrosian and he was 69 years old. Now, these videos were two of dozens of terrifying, horrific atrocity videos that were posted by Azerbaijanis during and after the war, videos that have been likened to ISIS's use of social media and technology to terrorize its victims during its genocidal campaigns, particularly against the Yazidis and Iraqi Christians and other national and religious minority groups in Iraq in 2014. Um, they are starting to be confirmed as, uh, as, as legitimate Azerbaijani um, atrocity videos by, human, by independent organizations um, in, so in a way similar to the way that the beheading of Gennady Petrosian was confirmed. A detail in the story of Petrosian's beheading that did not get much press, but that I think is very important as we think about enduring genocides, um, is that according to the Guardian, Petrosian moved to Artsakh, to Nagorno-Karabakh, from the seaside Azerbaijani city of Sumgait in the 1980s. Now this is relevant because Sumgait was the site of a terrible po pogrom against the city's Armenians in 1988, during which Armenian residents were killed, tortured, mutilated, burned alive, gang raped, and sexually abused for five days. It is quite possible then that Petrosian fled Sumgait in 1998 due to this pogrom only to have genocidal anti-Armenianism catch up to him as an older man in 2020. Either this, or he left Sumgait in the 80s as a consequence of the growing anti-Armenian hostility and violence um, in Azerbaijan at that time that was spurred on by the dissolution of the USSR and the question of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, many observers back in 1988 declared that the Sumgait pogrom had many of the characteristics of genocide, largely because of evidence suggesting that it was planned in advance and because, of the, because the atrocities showed such genocidal hostility to Armenians as a group. Certain members of the Azerbaijani mobs that committed atrocities had lists of Armenians living in Sumgait along with their addresses, and they were instig instigating violence against these specific people um, amongst the crowds. Violence spread after the Sumgait pogrom to other cities in Azerbaijan, including the capital city of Baku, where a pogrom in 1990 that took an estimated 100 victims brought an end to the large historical Armenian community there as Armenians were forced out of the city and chose to flee, many of them heading for Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. In Armenia, Sumgait and Baku, like the recent atrocities committed by Azerbaijani soldiers in Nagorno-Karabakh, raised the terrible specter of the 1915 genocide and the struggle of Armenians worldwide to find security in this modern world of nation states. This is the enduring genocide against the Armenians that I would like to call attention to. It's not just a past trauma, 
but a living wound with serious implication for our implications for Armenia's security in the future. The way that geopolitics, historical memory, and identity have converged in the present conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh um, requires that we ask ourselves, did the Armenian genocide in fact end? And if it did, what do we mean by that? And how is it after all that we can identify the end of a process like genocide? So I wanna talk a little bit about this Republic of Artsakh within this territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. So we could get a deeper sense of what's going on here. The Republic of Artsakh was a legal entity established amidst the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, when the majority Armenian population of Soviet Nagorno-Karabakh spearheaded a grassroots effort to pressure political leaders locally and in Moscow to allow the territory to gain independence from Azerbaijan. This desire was expressed several times by the majority population between 1988 and 1994, including in a 1991 referendum in which 99.8% of the voters voted, from independ voted for independence from Azerbaijan. This initiative was in fact a true grassroots self-determination movement among Armenians in Artsakh that had historical roots in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide and in the end of the First World War, when the new states of Armenia and Azer of, pardon me, of Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan were being carved out of the dissolving czarist Russian Empire. So a different Russian empire dissolving at that time. Decisions about which state could claim which parts of the territory were made based on the ethnic and religious affiliations of the majority populations in villages, towns, and cities across the region. While Georgia and Armenia could claim nations that dated back thousands of years, Azerbaijan was a new identity created out of Turkic groups in the region that had had historically, um, Turkic groups in the region that had historically been referred to as Tatars. For the Azerbaijani nationalists then, who were eager to claim territory for a new national home and establish legitimacy um, in those claims for territory, the pan-Turkism that had fueled the Armenian genocide, the recent Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire, offered them a rallying point for diverse peoples, as well as a powerful ally in the form of the Ottoman Empire in the territorial conflicts between Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan at the time. Now, Armenians who were, let me go back to, we go, the Caucasus slide. Now, Armenians who were highly urbanized and scattered throughout the Caucasus, often as merchants in cities, constituted the majority of only a small part of the region. The ma majority, in fact, of Armenia's historical lands lay instead in Eastern An Anatolia, in a territory that's now part of modern Turkey, um, which the Armenians call Western Armenia, and which had been lost to Armenians and in fact depopulated of all traces of an Armenian presence by the Ottomans genocide, the Ottoman Empire's genocide against the Armenians. This is one of the reasons that present day Armenia, you can see on the map, is so small. It's landlocked, resource poor, surrounded by um, what at different times have been enemies with only one small land bridge in the south. You can see that at the bottom tip of the purple um, territory of Armenia, um, one small land bridge to the friendly nation of Iran. This is a region that 
the Armenians called Siunik. Um, and you can see it runs between Azerbaijan and a small territory claimed by Azerbaijan called Nechichevan that is in fact disconnected from the larger portion of Azerbaijan. It should be little um, surprise then for me to note that Azerbaijan claims that territory, that sea unique territory as its own and calls it Zangazur. Um, one of the regions in the Caucasus um, in which the Armenians could claim to be majority after World War I without question was in fact Nagorno-Karabakh, um, where an estimated 90% of the population was Armenian. Throughout history, that region has been um, majority Armenian uh, with a percentage fluctuating between about 70% and you know, 95%. Armenians in 1920, just as in 1991, voted already then for independence and formed something called the Autonomous Region of Mountainous Karabakh to try to prevent the territory from coming under the control of the Azerbaijanis who were at that time fighting along with the Turks. In an effort to initially, the Russian Empire, which eventually after the war gained control of this entire region, um, was going to, uh, was going to organize Nagorno-Karabakh into the new Republic of Armenia, but Stalin stepped in and gave Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan for complicated reasons, mostly to appease um, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, right, which was at that time kind of forming into what is modern Turkey. Stalin called this territory, the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. So it was not, it did not become a full part of Azerbaijan, but retained some of its autonomous character and integrated it then in that capacity into the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic where it remained until the late 1980s and early 1990s. So this question of Nagorno-Karabakh um, which, you know, uh, has led to war throughout history. Um, this question of its legal status is very much also a question, not simply a question of, of recognized international borders, but also a question of national self-determination, as often happens um, in the wake of colonialism, in this case, Russian colonialism. So it's a question of national self-determination no matter which independent nation state claims the territory. But it is also furthermore another question. It's a question of justice for a small people, the Armenians, who lost out in World War I to genocidaires who were intent on bringing their presence in the region to an end and who brokered therefore an unjust peace um, in, the, in, in, the, in the midst of a silent international community that was interested in moving on more than it was interested in securing this, uh, the safety of the remaining Armenians. For Armenians all over the world, this most recent war in 2020 in Nagorno-Karabakh um, brought up, of course, the inherited historical trauma of the 1915 genocide. So I want to spend a short moment looking at that. Um, and as most of us probably know, during this genocide, this genocide witnessed brutality and hatred and violence, including widespread sexualized violence that took the lives of an estimated 1 million to 1.5 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And this constitutes from one half to three quarters of the total pre-war 
Ottoman Armenian population, um, making it one of the most thoroughgoing genocides in history. It displaced, it furthermore displaced the vast majority of um, those who survived to the Russian occupied Caucasus region. So many of the Armenians who were caught up in the fighting between Georgia um, and Azerbaijan, um, which was fighting alongside Turkish troops against Armenians, many of those caught up in that were also refugees from the Armenian genocide of 1915, 1916, so a few years prior in the Ottoman Empire. Many of these people also, survivors, um, also fled to diasporas in Europe, North America, the Middle East, and further in the Soviet Union. Um, diasporas that had been created through global trade networks that date back centuries, global Armenian trade networks that date back centuries, but also through previous massacres and persecutions under the Ottoman Empire, which had forced Armenians to flee prior to 1915. Now the 1915 genocide was a planned campaign against the Armenian presence. Um, and we have to say that very clearly, all the evidence suggests that, and there is no question among serious historians about the planned nature of the genocide against the Armenians. Um, and the Ottomans intended at this time to eliminate the Armenian presence in its entirety. Not only were Armenians killed and deported to the deserts of Syria and Iraq, but also their cultural heritage was destroyed, their place names erased and replaced, women who were taken hostage, who were kidnapped and taken hostage and forced to convert were prevented from speaking Armenian or practicing um, Armenian Orthodox religion or Armenian Orthodox Christianity. Um, and surviving Armenian orphans were placed in Tur Turkic, Turkish orphanages to be raised as Turks. So the Armenian genocide essentially and quite effectively brought to an end a civilization in Anatolia that was over 3000 years old and dated back to very large Armenian kingdoms that spanned the entire reach of present day Anatolia, so present day Turkey. While the ancient Armenian civilization of Anatolia was extinguished at this time, the ideology that extinguished this civilization never quite disappeared. It continued in the independent Republic of Turkey that was formed out of the chaos of the partition of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. And it continued in modern Turkish nationalism that did not reject the genocidal state policies of the Ottoman Empire, but rather subsumed them beneath the discourse of Turkish supremacy and Turkish nationalism. So while Turkey had destroyed its Christian populations in World War I, as well as other mi religious minorities, um, such as Yazidis and Alevis, who were also caught up in the violence, it still had a sizable Kurdish minority after World War I that controlled the now Armenian free zone of Eastern Anatolia. And that considers that also considers that region its ancestral home. So on this map, the portions that you see um, in purple or pink, right, where there were large scale massacres and deportations of Armenians, many of those territories were also claimed by and, and settled by, um, by Kurds. And as the Kurds say, while the Armenians were breakfast, the Kurds were lunch. And this basically means that the Kurds too could not find a safe space in modern Turkey where they have been um, massacred and persecuted since the founding of modern Turkey. 
Now, Turkey's recent foreign policy of expansionism, expansionism into northern Syria, apparent expansionism or the beginnings of expansionism into northern Iraq, expansionism into Libya, um, and its statements, political statements by Turkey that harken back to the Ottoman era pan-Turkic and pan-Islamic dreams of the political body that, were, that was the architect of the Armenian genocide, which was called the Committee of Union and Progress. Um, this expansionism and this pan-Turkic ideology constitute a threat, not just to Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also to Armenians and other Christian groups in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, as well as in the independent state of Armenia proper, which the president of um, Azerbaijan has recently um, threatened to invade. Okay. So generally speaking, I wanna step back for a moment and think about endings in the light of this history. Historians, and I am trained as a historian, will identify the end of genocide as a shorthand um, with the end of the mass killing stage of genocide. And often the end of mass killing coincides with the ends of wars and other armed conflicts. So we will speak, for example, of the Holocaust of European Jews ending in 1945, the Cambodian genocide ending in 1979, the Rwandan genocide ending in July 1994, and the Armenian gen genocide ending either in 1918 with the end of World War I or in 1923 with the end of international armed conflict in the Caucasus and in portions of Anatolia and the establishment of the new independent Turkish nation state. Now, while such chronologies make a certain degree of sense for interstate war, which is defined by the presence or absence of formal armed conflict and can be measured using pretty clear criteria, um, these chronologies make less sense for genocide in general which apart from being an international crime is also a long-term structural process that exceeds specific individuals and specific events. So while when we try the crime of genocide, we try individuals for their responsibility for the crime of genocide, the crime itself is caught up in a historical process that is much bigger than specific individuals um, and specific events. Within genocide studies, when we speak of the lasting consequences of genocide, we usually discuss intergenerational trauma within survivor families and new developments within epigenetics, for example, which suggests that trauma um, is literally written into the DNA of surviving families. And these sorts of discussions assume that the genocide is somehow over. Um, when we raise questions about justice, we generally view justice as occurring in the aftermath of genocide, that is, once genocide has ended. But I'm wondering, what if that is not the case? What if mass killing is an episode within a much larger process of destruction of a specific group based on its identity, which continues in either hot or cold form, right, for decades upon decades. There are structures that are established through the genocidal process, which if not addressed in some very direct form, can ensure in fact that genocidal dynamics will continue to act as a force against surviving populations from a mass murder stage of genocide, no matter what those populations do to try to overcome trauma within their own communities and reconstitute themselves and find security. And this is true for this region, as it is true for the region of Anatolia, as it is true for other regions in the world. And I believe that the Armenians are one of a number of groups, and in this case, a very, case, a very age old group, an ancient group, 
around the world who continue to be directly threatened by long-term and enduring genocidal structures. In this case, in the case of the Armenians, these structures, um, these are structures that are written deeply into the Turkish state and society and which have more recently begun to have global reach, both through um, the embracing, Azerbaijan's embracing, um, or recent sort of uh, revival of its embracing of pan-Turkish ideology, and through a new global reach of terrorist paramilitary organizations like the Grey Wolves, which is a uh, terrorist group an armed terrorist group that promotes extremist forms of Turkish nationalism and that now, operate, now operates with close relationships to both the Turkish state and the Azerbaijani state um, in a global fashion. A growing wave of hate crimes around the world have, has increased fears, in fact, amongst Armenians that the gray wolves are targeting Armenians, not just in Nagorno-Karabakh, not just in Turkey, not just in that region, but also in the diaspora where the Armenians have generally felt rather safe. Um, I'm showing here some photographs of hate, uh, hate crime against an Armenian school in San Francisco last summer, right before the beginning of this recent war in Nagorno-Karabakh. The Azerbaijani state has also embraced openly gray wolf ideology and a general in uh, the Azerbaijani military even flashed the gray wolf hand sign during the military parade celebrating Azerbaijani's victory, Azerbaijan's victory in this recent Nagorno-Karabakh war. So to return to Gennady Petrosian, the man who was beheaded on video and whose two videos of his beheading were posted to Telegram, um, his beheading was not just a sign of a remembered genocide past. So it didn't just unearth or, um, or re traumatize, unearth older traumas or re traumatize survivor populations, but this beheading was also a sign of the continuing presence of genocide against the Armenians. This beheading can be seen as a terrible manifestation of pan-Turkic anti-Armenian ideology, um, a manifestation of an ideology that Azerbaijan shares with the very powerful nation of Turkey. The video of Petrosian was one, I should note, of dozens that were posted by Azerbaijani accounts on Telegram, um, as well as on social media during and after the 44-day war. In other videos, just to give everyone a, a sense of, of what was happening during this war, Azerbaijani soldiers are shown beheading other Armenian civilians, executing them with gunfire, mutilating them while they're still alive, dragging people out of their homes and executing them in front of their homes on the pavement and burning their bodies while alive and after they've been killed. There are also videos of Azerbaijani soldiers executing disarmed Armenian prisoners of war humiliating prisoners of war by making them pose next to the Grey Wolves terrorist group hand sign, um, forcing them to kiss the Azerbaijani flag, forcing them to state on video that Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, and slapping and kicking and prodding injured Armenian um, POWs while taunting them for their vulnerability. There are also reports of Azerbaijani armed forces using white phosphorus in forested areas, which is a war crime, indiscriminately shelling civilian areas in Artsakh occupied by Armenians, 
targeting hospitals and cultural institutions such as churches and cathedrals and targeting journalists. Such reports are not hard to believe because there is ample evidence in fact, um, but also because Azerbaijan has already committed pogroms, as I mentioned, against Armenians, as well as what many scholars have called um, almost total cultural genocide against Armenian cultural heritage within its own territory, particularly within the territory of Nachichevan, where Azerbaijan seems to have destroyed all of um, um, a, these beautiful um, cross, uh, stone crosses that are called kachkars um, that date back centuries and that are a symbol of the historical, what was the historical Armenian presence in that part of Azerbaijan. While there were, it appears, war crimes also committed on the Armenian side, and one has to take those very seriously, they pale in comparison with the, Azerbaij the genocidal nature of Azerbaijani atrocities, which, as the list I just read to you suggests, exhibit an annihilatory logic, a desire to murder, humiliate, and defame people simply because of their identity as Armenians. This takes these crimes out of the realm of war crimes and places them more squarely within the realm of crimes against humanity and genocide. And perhaps even more crucially, Azerbaijan and Turkey have been engaging in a parallel information war, so a propaganda war that has run parallel to the war in Nagorno-Karabakh that um, bears the disturbing hallmarks of genocidal propaganda. In particular, Azerbaijan has accused Armenia of doing what it is in fact doing, which is a sort of projection that we have seen in other genocides as well. In one case, for example, one blatant case, it accused Armenia of using Syrian mercenaries in the war, a lie that was not even believed by anybody at the time, but that was meant to confuse the world enough that it might forget about Azerbaijan's use of foreign fighters supplied by Turkey. Azerbaijanis have also posted videos purporting to be videos of Armenian atrocities during the war, but that after investigation have been demonstrated to be videos drawn from other conflicts from other time periods and not involving Armenia at all. So the atrocities committed against Armenians during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, um, are an example of the consequences of nations and the world as a community doing too little to check the impunity of perpetrators after genocide. And in this case, the impunity of Turkey, its allies, and the impunity of the ideology of pan-Turkism. As a very um, clear example, of this, I would like to show you some images, some really shocking images from a recently constructed uh, military trophy park in the capital city of Baku in Azerbaijan. In the upper left square on the slide, you see a photograph of the Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev walking through two walls or between two walls of helmets of um, taken from fallen Armenian soldiers. And in the other photographs, you see fat wax figures of quote unquote Armenian types um, that are displayed throughout this military trophy park in various positions, including in positions that suggest they are wounded, they are dying, or they are already dead. 
On the day that the military trophy park opened about a month ago, um, there were very, very long lines to get into the trophy park and Azerbaijanis um, arrived there early on to line up with their families. Uh, children under six were allowed in free. And you could see from these photos that very little children were also brought to interact with these displays of Armenians. And as some people have noted, um, the Armenian faces, right, are, are exaggerated. So these figures that are supposed to represent Armenians are these exaggerated features, faces with exaggerated features um, that are reminiscent of um, anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda under the Third Reich, but that also draw on European racial science related to what was called in the 19th and early 20th century, the Armenoid type. And in an interview, the two men who designed the figures, the figures of our quote unquote Armenians for this uh, military trophy park, in an interview with the Russian press, um, these two men stated, we tried to create the ugliest representations. We usually try to do something beautiful, but now it was the other way around. It was a long and difficult process. We gave them hooked noses, flat heads, and other features. And those terms, hooked noses and flat heads, are sound, um, I mean, they are verbatim terms drawn from um, uh, European racialist descriptions of the Armenoid racial type in 19th and early 20th century European racial science. So in effect, what we see happening um, and, and being exposed in the war in Nagorno-Karabakh is that the genocide, the 1915 genocide against Armenians was in fact allowed not to end for strategic and resource related purposes um, by the authorities that established the present day, the modern state, modern Republic of Turkey, um, as well as by the international community. And I'm hoping that in light of this history, uh, the world community will not make the same mistake today and allow this sort of hatred, the type of impunity that can easily lead from genocidal atrocities to genocidal mass murder once again. And I wanna note that in the absence of external pressure, and particularly in the absence of international recognition of the Armenian genocide, it is profoundly difficult for members of Turkish civil society, for members of Azerbaijani civil society, who are not themselves imbued with anti-Armenianism and who are themselves critics of hate speech and critics of Turkey and Azerbaijan's current foreign policy, it's profoundly difficult for these members of civil society to affect lasting change because both of these states can constantly at moments of crisis or moments when political parties want to consolidate power, reach into their genocidal toolbox, which has not been discredited, and use techniques from that to target others and make them scapegoats for current political problems. So Turkey, for example, continually falls back on well-worn discourses of exclusion and on genocidal ideologies, as well as genocidal techniques that are drawn from a past that it still refuses to confront and to recognize. So I wanna say in conclusion that this talk was not meant to be a commentary on the legitimate territorial claims to Nagorno-Karabakh. 
The crisis there will need to be solved through legal and political mechanisms as cri similar crises all over the world. Though one worries, given the saber rattling, um, that they will continue to be settled in the Korno Karabakh by bloodshed. Instead, in this talk, I have hoped to draw our attention to a problem faced by Armenians as they seek to heal from the genocide of 1915. And that is the problem that their genocide is enduring. It has not fully ended. And the same structures that destroyed Armenians and their ancient civilization in Anatolia are operating now on either side of this very small independent Republic of Armenia. To affect change to this state of affairs, the international community, I believe, will need to integrate a genocide awareness framework, a genocide sensitive framework into its interpretations of conflict and its interpretations of lasting peace. Standing back and seeking a false balance without reference to these larger genocidal dynamics, or worse, accusing Armenians, as one sometimes hears, of harping on the issue, the old issue of genocide that is now 106 years old, um, in this case only serves to further re-entrench anti-Armenianism globally, anti-Armenian global processes, offering these processes impunity and furthering the cause of genocide denial. So I want to end by noting that in two days, the Armenians will commemorate the 106th anniversary of the genocide on April 24th. We are hearing in the news, we in the United States are hearing much about um, the predictions that the current US President Joe Biden um, is expected to recognize the genocide for the first time at that level of the US um, state. Such a recognition I want to propose would be much more than, um, than simply applying a label to a past tragedy. It's sometimes characterized that way. Such a recognition would be in fact a huge step forward in ending the impunity of anti-Armenianism, right? The impunity of this ideology within Turkey and Azerbaijan and would therefore be a huge step forward in creating a more secure world for Armenians and a world more conducive to real and lasting healing. Let us hope that Joe Biden does the right thing on Saturday, April 24th. Thank you very much. Lisa, um, thank you so much. I, I am so proud to be your colleague. Um, I, I find that um, such a rich presentation uh, with so many layers in it. And I found myself moved. I found myself upset. I found myself ashamed to be part of the, the community that has at times ignored this or not paid enough attention. Um, and, and I just think there has been such depth to what you have shared. I'm so glad that we've recorded it. I'm going to ask you for a copy if we can have it of the transcript of it that, that I want to make available. Uh, and I, I was sorry, I was remiss at the start of saying to people that if they want to ask questions, that there are questions that to do that in the, the Q&A section of the uh, of, on the bottom right hand side of the screen. And, and I know there are some questions, so I'm going to talk a little bit just to give you a chance to take a breath and to have a look at those, uh, because I, I couldn't help reflecting on some of the images that you presented. I, mean, I have a very visual mind, so I had the very, very disturbing image of the the man being beheaded. And I also find myself thinking about my own story where there is a there is a naive presentation of Northern Ireland, which starts a conflict back in 1969 when allegedly violence started. But actually, this story goes back generations and hundreds of years uh, to unresolved conflicts and unresolved atrocities. And, and I think that what you're saying helps me understand anyway that um, rarely there are things that are happening nowadays that happen out of the blue. There is a story behind them that has uh, that that acts as a context in which things have been created that have been permissible and allowed then to be repeated and repeated and repeated. 
So I, I mean, I, I just want to thank you for what you've you shared with us this evening. Um, I find it, if I'm honest, I find it disturbing, mm -hmm. and I think it should be disturbing. And so for that, I really appreciate it. I'm going to hand over to you to deal with some of the questions uh, uh, that I know people are asking. Um, and then uh, if you don't mind at the end, I'll say thank you at the end and we'll close. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much for those, those kind comments. And I do hope this is something that, um, that we'll all in our program and at the Cohen Center to continue to investigate in Ireland, right in Northern Ireland, um, in the South Caucasus region and in other parts of the world where uh, these abiding structure, genocidal structures um, uh, you know, are still quite powerful. And I would include North America uh, within, within that that uh, that rubric. Um, so I see one question, an excellent question here about uh, Biden's declaration of genocide, his expected declaration of genocide. Um, the question is, if it happens, how would a Biden declaration of genocide committed by Turkey against the Armenians in 1915 exacerbate the situation um, in Nagorno-Karabakh? And that's a very good question. It could. Um, there's been a debate for quite a long time about whether US recognition of the genocide in uh, the 1915 genocide of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire would stand in the way of the normalization of relations between um, independent Armenia and the Republic of Turkey. As it stands now, the border between Armenia and Turkey is closed. And um, even without recognition, there is no normalization of relations. Um, naturally, any recognition of a genocide will be received, at least initially, um, as, as hostility from the Biden administration and from the United States. And there are definite security risks involved in that, right? Um, especially if we think in terms of national security, which is uh, where uh, our, uh, Turkey is an important ally um, for American foreign policy. So there, there are risks, whether it would exacerbate um, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh is unclear. Uh, Aliyev has already indicated that he plans to, to invade that uh, small, part of Armenia in the south that separates um, Azerbaijan, pro Azerbaijan proper from this tiny part of Azerbaijan called Nechichevan, right? That he plans to invade it soon, right? Um, in order to create this corridor that is planned by Turkey and Azerbaijan that is mentioned in the November 9th ceasefire. Uh, so uh, Armenia was forced to sign the ceasefire allowing this, but, but, but that Armenia has not, and you know, I can't imagine plans to allow to, to happen anytime soon. So uh, uh, Aliyev wants to push the issue and, and, and that would mean invading Armenia proper. Aliyev has indicated um, in certain speeches that he actually sees all of Armenia, right? So he sees this Southern part, which the Armenians called Siunik. He sees it as Armenian the Armenian Terry of Zangazor. So it's even a different name. And uh, you know, certain statements he's made show that he sees all of Armenia, or he threatens all of Armenia, um, you know, uh, as part, or he views it as part of Azerbaijan and therefore threatens all of Armenia, the invasion of all of Armenia. He referenced during the war marching to Yerevan, for example, which is the capital of Armenia further north above the Nagorno-Karabakh region. So the, the situation is already, already very bad in Nagorno-Karabakh. And in such situations, my sense is that a public recognition by a powerful force like the United States can do nothing but good um, because it sends a clear message that there are limits to what is acceptable and there are limits uh, to what will be defined outside of the crime of genocide. So by saying what happened in 1915 was genocide, the Biden administration will in a sense be sending a message that if similar things begin to happen, perhaps at, um, you know, in a broader way than happened in this past war, 
that both Turkey and Azerbaijan may be risking um, genocide indictments, right, under the principle of your, your uh, universal jurisdiction around the world. So it sends a message that may tamp down a bit on the more aggressive nature of the type of propaganda war and, and actual armed uh, conflict that, um, that Turkey and Azerbaijan are engaging in. So, you know, there's always that worry that this will sort of inflame passions um, and create the conditions for more war. And I myself worry about that. On the other hand, we've seen time and time again that the continued silence about, you know, what is clearly genocide um, seems only to empower perpetrators in the short and the long term. A similar case can be made for what's happening to Uyghur Muslims in China, what's happening to the Rohingya in Myanmar, and what's happening to other people around the world. It seems to me always better to speak the truth that these atrocities um, uh, at least amount to what could be decided in a court of law to be a crime of genocide. It's much better to state that than to beat around the bush, um, which genocide dares so often see as a green light to, to further atrocity. So it's a very good question. I would hope that Biden's recognition would not exacerbate the situation. And in my view, it, can, it really, at this point, can only help the situation by sending a message that maybe the United States um, uh, will make diplomatic efforts to ensure that, that the Armenian uh, Republic, at least, is safe. So I hope that answered that question. And um, another question is very similar, um, which is given the recent decision by the Biden administration to declare the Armenian genocide a genocide come this Saturday on the 106th anniversary of its start. This is a, this is a question from one of my students and it's super well <laughs> informed. So I'm very proud of you, Eric. Um, uh, do you think this will begin a process of weakening Turkey's denialism of the genocide? Yes, absolutely, I do. You know, and there is some evidence, well, I mean, I don't know if that's true in the short term, actually, but there's some evidence that the uh, national security fallout from such recognitions are more bark than actual bite. So when German, when the German parliament recognized its role in the Armenian genocide, Germany was a ally of the Ottoman Empire in World War I and played a very strong role in uh, at least not standing in the way of Ottoman authorities um, in committing this genocide. When the German parliament recognized its role in a genocide that the perpetrators of the genocide had not yet recognized, that is Turkey, right? Um, there was a, you know, kind of quick diplomatic skirmish, but, but uh, passions sort of died down after a time. And there don't seem to be too many serious national security fallouts from that, um, from the German point of view. And that um, was a really an enormously important recognition of the genocide that um, enabled um, it just it just added to the particularly the <laughs> the evidence that was introduced as part of this parliamentary decision in Germany simply added to the case that you know we cannot we can no longer resist this genocide there's just too much evidence that it was a genocide and it allowed a new conversation particularly since this was coming from Germany, the perpetrator of the Holocaust, it allowed a new conversation about the benefits really as a perpetrator nation in recognizing the past wrongs, right? In recognizing past crimes and taking responsibility for them. And some of those benefits arguably are, you know, a shoring up of democratic um, institutions, within society, which is not something that the present leader of Turkey wants necessarily, um, but that in the long term does create a much safer social order for everyone, especially, you know, given that Turkey has this enormous Kurdish population that it has to deal with in one way or another, and that the current persecutorial mode is not, is not serving the interests of 
either from the Kurdish point of view or, or the Turkish point of view. So I do think it'll weaken Turkey's denialism over time and eventually perhaps simply lead to a recognition in Turkey that there's no use in denying this any longer. And that can open up explorations that I think will be extremely um, uh, conducive to peace in the entire Middle Eastern region. Do you know if we accept that Turkey is a massive economy, you know, and it is, is a major regional power, um, it, it, it behooves all of us to hope that that regional power will do some self, some, some um, self awareness, right, um, about about its its uh, uh, about its genocidal past in order to prevent that in the future. And I think there's one last question. There are a couple. Okay, so one, as I sort of answered the question about um, a recognition of the genocide not exacerbating the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the questioner says they want Biden to declare it a genocide, but there will be fallout. Yes, exactly. I, I, I agree, there will be. And as always, you know, fallout is, is, is unpredictable. Okay. Are there any avenues? I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to answer a few more questions. Are there any avenues to encourage President Biden to make the declaration of recognition? Yes, absolutely. We have two days to continue to write to the White House asking for that recognition and stating our own case. Of course, you know, you could sign, there are petitions out there as well, and maybe we could put them up, I, I don't know, on the Cohen Center webpage, perhaps not, but you can find them. Um, but uh, there are petitions out there. Um, but, you know, as always, it's better to write you know, sort of your own phrased email. It can be very short, just stating that you would agree with such a recognition of the genocide. Um, Yes, one person asks, states, it seems that once the physical violence ends, the psychological, emotional, social, and cultural impact continues. What would you suggest is needed to address these forms of non-physical violence? It seems like if those non-physical violences um, are not addressed, it is easier return to return to physical violence. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. I think recognition is the first step, recognition of the wrongs done. Um, I think, you know, I've been very influenced by a wonderful group of people at Keene State College, uh, faculty, staff, and students who have been engaging in restorative justice practices. I think something like that is definitely needed in, uh, in, in, in the region of the South Caucasus, um, as well as in the Middle East more generally. And that's some of the work that I do. But I think we need to start those conversations with a very clear evidentiary basis, right, that uh, does not deny the, the character of what happened to Armenians and other minorities in this region, what's been happening for at least the last 100 years. And then there's, I hope I'm not missing any questions. There's a wonderful um, question about Armenian cultural production in literature, film, museums, and schools memorializing the Armenian uh, genocide and whether it's contributed to raising awareness of genocide. And I think it's one of the few things that kept the memory of the genocide alive for the decades right after World War I and then after World War II when, um, when the world was obsessed with other things, it was obsessed with World War II, was obsessed with the rise of fascism in Europe, the rise of totalitarianism in the USSR, um, with the Holocaust after after you know that that crime became apparent, um, and and it was through kind of cultural production that Armenians kept that uh, memory alive, and then um, and and certainly that spurred initial efforts to have that genocide recognized in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and then since the centenary of the, of the genocide in 2015, just the sheer amount of cultural production and memorialization has been such that um, when I started um, teaching genocide studies back in the early 2000s, so many people had never heard 
of the Armenian genocide, much less Armenians. They have no idea what, what are the Armenians, you know. Um, but after 2015, in the United States, but in other places in the world as well, it seems that almost everyone worldwide has heard of the Armenians and knows something about the Armenian genocide. And I think we can really credit um, cultural production for a lot of that growing recognition since 2015. Um, so I, I don't wanna take up too much of everybody's time. I know it's gotten very late. Um, so Peter, shall I answer one more question yeah, or I'm, shall I think Lisa's testament to the depth and quality of what you said. We've got far too many questions and not enough time to answer, but maybe if you would pick one or two more just, just to finish with, um, I think that would be, you know, it would be wonderful. I'm sure, I know people have, have, uh, are excited and have invested a lot in, in thinking up questions for you. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take one. Uh, from, from a colleague, uh, many of the stories and aspects of hot and cold phases of genocide that you shared have strong parallels with the ongoing genocide of indigenous people in the Americas. I'm wondering if you have thoughts you could share on those parallels. Um, yes, I, I think that, that uh, what happened to the Armenians does have parallels with indigenous peoples in the Americas and also parallels with African Americans and, and African American history in, uh, in the United States in particular. Um, in terms of what those parallels are, I would say uh, simply a social order that deep down um, is structured around hostility to native American, African American life. Armenians, along with other um, religious and national minorities in the Middle East, often refer to themselves as the indigenous people because their presence in those lands dates back so long. So the Assyrians can date their presence back 10,000 years, for example, um, and Yazidis can date their, their presence back thousands of years. Um, so there are many minority groups in the region, um, in the region of the Middle East that see themselves um, as indigenous groups akin to indigenous groups in the settler societies of North and South America, Australia, parts of Africa, et cetera. Um, and you know, I, indigeneity is, um, sort of ancientness, um, number one, it, it, it's, um, it's such a difficult issue, claims of indigeneity, right? So I wanna give an example from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. One of the things that other Azerbaijanis have done in order to counter Armenian claims to Nagorno-Karabakh is to suggest that uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis um, date back to a, much older ethnic group, even than the Armenians called the Caucasian Albanians. And that because of that, um, and, that, and, that, and that somehow Azerbaijan is the true inheritor of Caucasian Albanian identity, and that Armenians are really not indigenous, but a, a, you know, newcomers that, that kind of established empires over Caucasian Albanians, um, and therefore that all of that territory is really part of Azerbaijan because Azerbaijanis are present day, are the present day inheritors of Caucasian Albanian identity. So there can often be um, attempts to sort of reach even further back, right, and invent indigeneity. And this is particularly true in the Middle East, which is such a, such a confluence of different cultures and, and kingdoms and trade routes that, that, in that in that space, this claim of indigeneity, uh, while we have to take seriously the need for people to have safe territories and secure territories, it, it can also be part of the problem. However, the, there are parallels, and that is a kind of, a kind of, a kind of yes, structural hostility to the presence of certain groups that is based in supremacist claims to the land on which these groups have lived 
for centuries. And that hostility does not have to be experienced by individual North Americans or by individual Turks or by individual Azerbaijanis who in fact may recognize past genocides or may, may be quite sympathetic to the groups um, being slowly, mar you know, increasingly marginalized and erased, um, but simply by participating in the social life as is. Um, you know, we, and I say we because I am a white North American, we participate in ongoing genocidal structures. And what needs to happen in the United States, as well as in Turkey, um, I would say, is a fair and honest accounting with our past and you know, really radical reforms to our um, structures of government and our social structures that seek to undo the long-term harm that our past genocides have done. That's a long multi-generational project, but it's one um, which once certain groups get over the sense that they're going to be sort of marginalized or forced down or persecuted as a consequence of losing this sort of blind, um, this, this blind privilege that they've inherited, once they sort of get over that, this, this is a project that benefits humanity because it has been shown in other contexts to really create much more resilient and much stronger social structures that work for the benefit of all and drastically reduce the horrible daily violence that post-genocidal societies experience in general, right? The entire population experiences that. And we know that in the United States from the horrific violence enacted against by the state against Native Americans, the horrific police violence against African Americans and people of color, and just the terrible mass shootings that are happening on a daily basis. Similar, Turkey exists in, in a similarly um, violent society and and it and it brings everybody down so those are some of the similarities i see and thank you for that question thank you thank you so much elisa i, I mean i do think it is testament to, to the the quality and depth of what you said that we're not going to have time to answer those questions all of these questions uh, but we will make um, the presentation available online uh, we will, I think, if we can make your script available, just if people want to be able to read that and, and, and get into detail of that. And if it's not cheeky of me, I'm going to make you available if people want to contact you directly oh, with questions. Yeah. Um, your email address is on the website. And, and I'm, I, know, I, I know because of the kind of person you are uh, that you would be happy for people to contact you directly. I can't thank you enough for tonight. I feel as if I have had just a, a huge meal of of information that uh, that i now need to go away and digest as i said it was multi-layered multi-faceted it evoked a whole variety of emotions within me it stimulated me intellectually and it makes me want to now do something and learn more so uh, i couldn't ask for a better presentation uh, and I, as i said at the very start i'm very proud to call myself a colleague and it, it is a joy listening to you and a pleasure working with you. Thank you for all of the effort you put into preparing this evening. It's clearly, you know, a huge amount of work. Uh, we appreciate it. We have learned from it. Uh, and I know that it will make a difference. Uh, and so I just want to thank you for that uh, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everybody who's had the privilege of listening to you. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Peter and the Cohen Center and Michelle Ku. I know I'm going to get your name wrong. I always do. Ku Kuiwa? <laughs> Peter, how do you say it? Don't ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, to yeah. Michelle yeah. and Misty for, for setting up all the technology and all the stuff yeah. at the Cohen Center and at Keene State College and the audience. Thank yeah. you for bearing with me for so long tonight. Uh, it's and for Misty, so Misty honor. too, who's been uh, working the, the, the magic behind the scenes, and thank you to all our participants. It's not insignificant that the number has stayed the same right through the whole presentation. Ooh. So no, nobody fell off, uh, and it was a great audience. So thank you all. Have a safe evening. Thank you for your participation this evening, and we look forward to more events in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.